thanks for this long introduction. It was longer than my talk, I think. And thanks for inviting me to give this speech here, uh, the super president and uh, the board. I'll talk about uh, climate change effect on aquatic ecosystem. And I'll use uh, the Turkish lakes as an example. But uh, there could be many other things. But now, now I take this as an example. And I'm uh, doing this in collaboration with other people, Mary and Beglioglu, Suhal, and uh, Kohan. And Kohan is a member of the DD program. Or the, and he got an award last year. And uh, this is uh, Lake Tush, Tush Gullu. And it's uh, some years ago, very nice tens of thousands of flamingos in this lake. And it's only a few years ago, and I'll show you later that it, uh, things have changed dramatically over the last few decades. This is the situation in 2021 in Lake Tus. The one to the left is probably from 2020, but uh, I took this picture in 2021. The flamingo, this is the, it's not a done, duck, done of anything. It's flamingo babies you have to the left. They died because there are not enough water and there are not, not enough food. And I'll show you about the food later. Instead, humans have taken over. And they're not walking on ice here in winter. This is summertime on salt. And then we can discuss what is the reason for these changes. And I'll show you quite grim uh, pictures from other parts of Turkey. Is it unsustainable use of water for farming? Or is it climate change? I'm sure that the farmers and maybe also the government will say climate change because it's very convenient to say climate change. But if the climate could speak, it cannot. It will take it say that it's not me. It's uh, humans are affecting me, but the, the thing you see there is not my fault. It's the farming policy that is wrong. Let's start with the climate. And it is a factor that there will have a big effect on Turkey in the future, and you'll see it within a minute. The temperature is increasing, we all know that. And now we also accept that it's the human-induced changes we are dealing with. Depending on which scenario we run, run on, what we are doing in the future, we'll run on different uh, levels here. But for sure, temperature will increase a lot. But what is equally important or maybe even more important, is that the precipitation pattern will change dramatically in the coming 100 years up to 2021. These are different uh, scenarios. 1.5 uh, degrees increase in temperature, 2 degrees increase, and 4 degrees increase in temperature. And you see here, if it becomes more green, it rains more. And we are talking about something with 40% when it's very green, and when we are brown here, very brown, 40% decline. And where is Turkey here? Very bad. You are affected dramatically in the coming years by uh, change in precipitation. And with increase in temperature, you also have more evaporation. So this net balance of water will be very grim for Turkey in the future. And you have to react to that now, because it is coming. In other places where I live in Denmark, it's raining more and more. And just the last 100 years, the rain has increased by 20% over 100 years. So it's already ongoing. And the same here, of course. The other thing that a consequence of this is the land in drought. Land that sometimes are dry is increasing. And it goes from 25% in the world to 50%. So doubling of the area that are in drought. This is not good seen from an agriculture point of view. And this also means it's not good for us. And if we try to look at the agriculture capacity, where you can run agriculture without irrigation, without irrigation. I'll come back to irrigation soon. But this is without irrigation. And the greener it is, the better it is. 
Turkey is a little bit brown here, so it's not too good already. So of course, there are parts of Turkey that are better than others, but uh, you can see it's already brown there. And this is the change. It's not uh, how it will be in the future. It's the change up to 2080. We can go back. See this? Huge change that we are dealing with here. Up to 100% in some places change in the capacity to do this. And some of the areas in uh, Russia, it will be very good for agriculture, but other parts will be bad because it will be highlands. Somewhere in the, if you take the Norway's mountains. So this will not be used even though it's green now, so it cannot be used for agriculture. So we have less land for agriculture in the future. But we are more people. We are 50% more people by the end of this century than we were in the beginning. And also, some of them are feeding higher in the food web. Uh, Chinese have shifted a little bit from rice to more meat uh, eating. And there are quite many Chinese. Others have been eating meat all the time, like this guy here. Uh, it's from Argentina. They are not eating uh, anything else but meat and a little bit papa fritas, a little bit potatoes also, but not much. And then we have also a lot of pets. And in Michi, we have a lot of pets inside the campus also. More pets than... Uh, and the more dogs than the students, I always say. But the problem with going up in the food web and eating higher, eating meat instead of uh, crops, is that we use much more water because it has to go through the crops and then to the cows or what it is, wherever you are. And I can make an example here for potato to beef, 40 to 45 times more water are needed for one kilo. Uh, for every kilo of production, 40 times more. So we have to think about that also. The other thing is that because we are more people, and also Turkey has a much higher population, we are starting to uh, do farming, different farming than we did before in many places in the world of dry area. This is an arid land. Typically, it should be with uh, with goats or with sheep or something like that. That should be the natural population there. But it has changed to crop production in many places only because now it's possible to do irrigation. So you pump up groundwater and you get an effect on the system. And you can see the effect. This is a desert farming in northwest China. It's a river that are running in this area. And this is the base flow. This is the summer uh, run. You can see it in the winter higher and so But over just a few years here, going down. Simply because the water is used for irrigation instead of staying in the river where it naturally was flowing. But this is the same in Turkey. See the pictures are exactly the same. Some green spots in between the very gray or brown. Very good for production, but not necessarily good for the environment where you are. And we have a project now, uh, BDEP 2232, uh, where we work on these kind of problems, with, and especially focusing on saline lakes. But we do everything we can. We are looking at uh, the system themselves. We do experiments. We are doing modeling. And we are doing all, all kinds of things. I'm not going to detail with this, because we have a very broad uh, audience here. So I'll not talk a lot about small biological things there. But I'll try to show you what we have found out uh, in, in, by looking at the lakes in different parts of Turkey. I'll say that we are also trying to look at in Kazakhstan, in lakes up there with different salinities. We see lake, lakes with different salinities to try to understand how they react to change in salinity. We are doing experiments both in Mersin and in Ankara. You can see some of the experiments here where we can control salinity so we can look at what a salt, how does it affect the system. And here is in Mersin, we have built up for this uh, BIDEP 2.2 project, thanks to a good amount of money. But now let's take the Turkish lakes and start in the Konya Basin. This is clearly salt lakes, as you can see, the saline. And we have in the Konya Basin, we have the freshwater lakes down here. This is the biggest freshwater lake, Lake Beji here. And then it runs to the north, and they become more and more saline. You can see the salinity is given here in this figure. So they become more, and here you have Lake Tusa, of course. So we have fresh water going to saline water. In this area, 
there your key production is, of course, for ag uh, agriculture production. And there have been dramatical changes over the last years. This is the production, total production of crops uh, given here over the time period since 1980, going uh, slowly up, but going up, and suddenly it goes up to very high levels. And this is the last 20 years, this increases. And this is the calculated water use you have here, increasing, suddenly going to dramatically high levels. So the last 20 years, the water use in the area has doubled almost. And the problem is that it's not only increasing in crops, it's also changed in type of crops. So now it's maize and sugar beets to a large extent, and they are water thirsty crops. Back in time, it was winter wheat that stayed over and it was not irrigated at all. Now they really need irrigation to keep these crops running. Very big change. And what is the consequences? This is the groundwater level. And this is, let's just take these two here in the middle of the Konya Basin, how they are going over time here. Going already down at this time when you had that increase in crop production and see the last years here, the last 20 years. One to two meter of water level is it's going down. It's one to two meter every year. Every year, one to two meter. So it's no recharge in winter and anything. It's just lost. And this is, of course, not sustainable because there are limitations for how long time you can continue with that. Then agriculture is completely gone in the area. You had to dig deeper and deeper and deeper to get the water. One of the problems in this area is not only increasing production, it's also how you, you use the, uh, how you use the water. Back in time, and still many places, you see these channel ones. A lot of evaporation, a lot of loss of water there. Now you see everywhere in the Konya Basin and others, sprinklers running 24 hours a day. In Denmark, you'll, not have, you'll have sprinklers, uh, you have much more water, but you'll never use them in the daytime. But here is ne needed to in the daytime also, and we are not using it because of evaporation. But here you need it because there's not enough water. So this is a shift in, the, and there's a lot of investments in these sprinklers now. And it should be drip culture. In such an arid area, they should not have sprinkler at all. You, it costs twice as much water to have a sprinkler than if you have drip culture. So all agriculture should be drip agriculture in the Konya Basin. Nothing at all should be like this. It's difficult to change because people have invested in sprinklers. So it's not easy. The consequences of all this groundwater level decline is you have seen a lot of sinkholes around in the country and the land. But for us that work with lakes and surface water, then this is not nice. This is your tourist attraction, Mekagulu. This is in 1997. This is 2007. Now. And satellites are never lying. And we have satellite pictures from 1985. And this is, you can see, the, here you have the, the crater and then the water around, maybe not so easy to see, but when it's uh, blue, it's water. Now it become a little bit more saline, a little bit later you can see saline, 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 and then it disappears. So over a very few years here, you have lost this lake completely. And you can see how it was here. This is the area of the lake, and suddenly it goes down. And remember, this is the last 20 years we have had when we increase the agriculture. It's exactly where the increase in agriculture and water use is. So we lost this because of groundwater reduction. Of course, climate is adding to this, but this is a clear indication that it comes from the farming. Here is Lake Duden. That's the safe place, was the safe place for the flamingos after Le Lake uh, Gulu, no, the Lake Tus were getting dry. And this is Lake Duden near Kulu. Over time, also satellite pictures. And it's making here to see the area, uh, which go down. And 2021, where we want to sample it, completely dry. And this has consequences. Of course, if you're dry, everything is gone. But it's uh, in the area as a whole, at Konya Basin, we have lost 42 bird species. 
And a lot of endemic species, uh, fish species, are under pressure. And you have in Turkey a large amount of endemic species. This means species that are only in Turkey and nowhere else in the world. And they came when we had ice coverage in the north. You had a boreal wetland. It was a wetland, a very big wetland, Konya Basin. A lot of uh, organisms were developed, and they are only here now. And they cannot speak for themselves because they are under the water. We always take care of baby seals because they have eyes like us, or pandas that also look like us. But fish are only saying wop, wop, and therefore we are not taking care of them. And they are leaving. And you can see when it happens with the birds, see some of the white headed dog is a very iconic one for Turkey. Again, the same beginning of the, this century here, 2005, which gone. So this is a dramatical shift we have. And when it gets warmer, then we have to add to this. It's already getting warmer, as I said, but uh, it will be worse. In it. And I'll try to show you one example uh, where we try to model it. It's a, a PhD student, Busak, to have done it. And it's Lake Beji here, the biggest freshwater lake in your country. And here is the prognosis for water level in this lake here. It's around nine meters at the moment. And then there are different models. There are this head model, and there's another model here. And this is the 4.5 degree, degrees scenario. It's the 8.5 degree scenario. So that's the worst one we have at the moment. This is the middle one. And you can see here, it will run dry. Whatever models you use, the lake will run dry at times from time to time. This is 1,500 square kilometer big lake. And it won't dry. So there's things to take. You have to take action. And the only water that is left there is from the cry of the people around the lake these days. Then you can say, ah, it's just the Konya Basin. We need agriculture practice. We need food. So let the farmers get Konya. Then we take the rest for the, the, the rest of us. But it's not only Konya Basin. This is actually a Gulu. Nice lake here on Gulu, 350 square kilometer big. And this is the change over time here. And then it reaches a threshold level, gone. Happening over a very short time period. And Google could not even follow it. Google was delayed in the response to this. So it looks like there was a lake still. But it was gone. So telling how fast it goes. Then you can say, ah, this was outside. This is just a little bit outside Konya Basin. But then we take Bordeaux, the Bordeaux Basin. This is another agriculture area. Uh, and then we can have a lot of uh, good lakes here. You know, the Salva Lakes and the Bordeaux Lakes, the nice iconic lakes. Uh, you have a white-headed ducks where the dominating one, a very big part of the population in the world were here. And then you can see the changes again with the satellite. Maybe not so easy to see on this figure here, but you can see that they gradually become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And smaller. Oh. So we don't lost one figure here. Same procedure. Uh, production increase, not as exactly as much as in the Konya Basin, but very much. And, and again, maize, the yellow one is maize. Not some sugar beet, because there's too little water in this area for really for sugar beets, but maize can be there, and they are very water thirsty crops. And then you have a reduction in uh, the agriculture and either animal production, but then you produce uh, food for them, and then it goes up again. And we can see how the changes have been just go into one of the lakes here. This is 1985, and uh, here you have the major agriculture part uh, in this catchment to this lake. And you can see that it's just here. There. And there have been no change, if you look at the satellites, in agriculture area. But the crop types have changed to more water-thirsty crops. And you can see that by the red spot here. The red spot is where you have irrigation. And you can take it from the satellites. It's wet area. So it's more wet than the others. And you can see this is 2005. And now in 2020, much more irrigation. Before, it was this wheat that should be a little bit there. And now it's irrigated crops. And what happens? This is the lake. Gone. 
on the way. It's not completely gone. Turkey is not the only place in the world where this happens. Uh, you can not, not only blame yourself. You have, uh, the world has similar examples. And the Aral Sea is probably the most iconic one. 68,000 square kilometer, big lake. And now it's like this. Because they directed the rivers away for agriculture production. And of course, also climate adds to this, but it's not uh, the major city. Omiya in Iran is another example. And you can see here, lost 90%. It's a very big lake also. Lost 90%. And uh, this is also a very short time period. They are trying to gain it back by having changing agriculture practice, but it's not functioning too well at the moment. It's still it's, uh, improved a little bit, but not enough. And here we have the Great Lake in the uh, USA, uh, Great Salt Lake in Utah. And uh, it has lost 48% of its volume. And here they have made uh, very clear and models on this. And we are doing that for the Turkish lakes also, but no data at the moment. Where they try to say, what would have happened if it was only climate? And this is the blue line here. So it goes up and down. There are dry years, there are wet years, and so on. But overall, there are no really changes over time here. But the red one is the real one, indicating that it's humans that are doing the work. Or well, the models are wrong, but I don't think the models are wrong. Here. The other thing that happens is that uh, when, if you're not losing the lakes, you, they become more saline. And here is an example from uh, northwest China where we have been working in a lot of lakes to, with different salinities to, to try to understand what are the consequences of different salinities on the flora and fauna uh, in the systems. Oh. And this is a general picture. This is just from one of the organism types. The number of uh, species we have and the uh, salinity here in the log scale. And you can see whoosh, going down. So when the lakes become more saline, you lose diversity. There are specialists that win, and others are gone. Here is another example from China. It's, uh, we've been working also in, in Tibet. And this shows also that th this is a threshold response. That we have sudden, at a cer certain salinity level, really big shift. And one of the shifts is that uh, at a certain point, we lose the fish at a given salinity. And then the, uh, the other part reacts to that because fish eat Daphnia, and now Daphnia comes in. But as the salinity is higher, then Daphnia cannot take it anymore. And then we get these Artemia, these fairy shrimp, the shrimps that uh, the flamingo loves. So this is flamingo area here. They are not taking these ones here, but they take these ones. And you can see that here with the data also, that it's not just a cartoon. These are the data where you can see the Daphnia, and here you have these guys here that the flamingos eat. Very short, narrow shift in salinity, big shift in the entire ecosystem. And then you continue with increasing salinity. And then uh, Lake Uomia is a good example, because now salinity goes up in this direction, this total dissolved solid. So salinity goes up here. And we have the flamingo area here. This is the flamingos, the blue ones. And we have the artemia, the shrimps here. And then they disappear for two reasons. There's no food anymore because Artemia cannot tolerate so high salinities. And secondly, because the water level goes down. So you can see this is an exam where you overturn. And this is the same in Tush. There are no data for that. But it would be the same in Lake Tush. So dramatical shift at very short intervals. So now we come back to this one before I finish up. Is it unsustainable water for farming, or is it climate change? You can see at the moment, it is the agriculture. In the future, it's a mixture of the two. And we have to take actions for both, you can say. It's time for actions. Because you are really losing iconic lakes. You are losing iconic species, endemic species that are only here. And you have to take care of them for the world. You cannot only say that. The, uh, we take care of this for ourselves. It's the world that have these endemic species. What can we do? One is, of course, to reduce the greenhouse gases. If the climate part of it, we have to do that everywhere. Or carbon stories, and there's a lot of work to, uh, on this now. Then locally, we have to do the same. Of course, we have also to reduce the greenhouse gases. 
but we can do a lot of things with culture, not sprinkler, or more primitive methods. That will help. And then there's a problem here in Turkey that wells are illegal, many of them. They have to be legalized so you can control the water use. And there needs to be a restriction of water use for farmers. And I can tell this, give this example from uh, Denmark where you cannot say farmers know best. They always say, they, I know best how to do this. You should not come and interfere with me because I know what's best. But for, for Denmark, we had uh, not water because we have a lot of water, but we had nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, fertilization. And then the farmers added a lot of fertilizer and the lakes became very green. And uh, they said, we know how to do it. But they didn't know how to do it. They, they know, knew how to do it, but they didn't want to do it because it's conservatism is there. And then what they, after the forced plants for fertilization, they even gained money and the production didn't go down because they said, production will go down. There'll be no chance at all in the future if you stop us using this. But that was the case. And I think it's the same here. You have to do something against this. And then there are some uh, ideas, and they're already done in the Konya Basin. We just take water from another basin and put it in there. But this basin is losing water then. And then it's, you just transfer the problem to another place. And then we can go down and eat less of these kind of things. And another thing that get, uh, I didn't talk about, but uh, uh, a lot of uh, invasive species are added to the system or have been added to the system, and they also affect our endemic species. Thanks for inviting me.